Welcome to the Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church with your host, Jay Ewing. I'm one of the pastors on staff here and reside usually on the Erie campus. We're so glad you're tuning in, no matter where where you're coming from or where you've been. We're thankful for you to tune in. If you check us out on YouTube, you can see our radio faces. If you're listening today... Thanks for listening on your commute, no matter where you're going. Hope your day is filled with lots of grace and peace and fruits of the Spirit, because we all need it, my friends. All right, we have Thomas in the booth today. No matter where you find yourself, you need to go to calvarybible.com, click your campus, find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. The fall is definitely in full swing, and Christmas is coming so many things happening at calvary we want you to make sure you're informed you're connected go to calvarybible.com also you can always comment on the youtube we actually pay attention to that and also give us a five-star review nothing but five stars on your podcasting platform and let us know that you're listening that's enough announcements thomas you remember the day good job jay you remember the day you picked this song out not Long really. That was, yeah, that was many, many moons, many moons. Hey, I wanted to start today by asking you to give us a review, a personal review, because this weekend you got to attend a CU Buff game. I did. Was it? It wasn't your first CU Buff game ever. Definitely not. Okay. Was it any of your family members' first CU Buff game ever? You know, it was one of the four of us. All the right. other, we went. We went to the. Uh, Mile High CU versus A&M okay. game. Okay. So well, it's well, the you first time. As, you went as Aggie fans. Yeah, totally. Okay, so this is the first time you stepped into holy ground at you, Folsom Field. You know what? Folsom Field is one of the best venues in college football. Yeah, they're burning incense all day. <laughs> <laughs> the The problem with Folsom Field, it needs to be upgraded, especially behind what? The scenes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's just like everybody's house, man. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> we bought a new lampshade, but don't go upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay, amazed so, at how old the things that are outside of the stadium itself yeah. are. It may have been when the Lord founded the earth. <laughs> but, okay, so you're there. You saw Ralphie run? Oh, totally. The and, flyover was great. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is this the... Demonstration of what wind. the day's going to look like. Oh, wind, wind. The wind Knocked got him. Yeah. It's too bad. But it wasn't even like F6. F6 okay. If it was like, it was like a fire prevention yeah. guy. <laughs> fire <laughs> prevention. I mean, it's a it's, crop duster. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> like, I was expecting when they said fire, I was like, oh, F16s are in the building or yeah. warhogs or something. Yeah. And those guys are like, wind, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. That's you true. know what I mean? That's true. Like, that. The guy's Wait, like, I'm driving a bus. I'm driving a bus. Bus. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna throw this out to everybody who yeah. wants to see the greatest flyover of all time. Yes, is Fourth of July, right? Uray, Colorado. Okay, because you know they get the flyovers of all the cities yeah. on the fourth, and then in Uray, they're doing the mountain town circuit, and they just drop into the canyon. Oh man, just scream! Oh my gosh, it. car alarms are going off, babies are screaming, <laughs> That's and I'm great. like, America! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's great. It's That's so great. good. All right. But it was a good experience for you? Yeah, it was a good experience. You know, that's interesting. It just happenstance yeah. that we'll be attending a Texas A&M game this weekend okay. in Texas. In Texas. Go- going back Thanksgiving week. And would you say the Buff game <laughs> is, is lacking compared no, to the 12th man? I, I think I'm always appalled at the student section at CU. Well, I mean, listen, I've been there when, like, entire sections are getting kicked out of the game. Right. <laughs> I see fans, and I'm one of them, are terrible. Yeah. They're just not good fans. It's just but, interesting. It's interesting the culture in which you set and the precedence in which you set when yeah. you have traditions. You know what I mean? Like, it's super interesting. Yeah. Because at Texas A&M, when I've been there, like, the students are opening doors and keeping them open. And take, you have to take your hat off to walk into the student center. Oh, okay. At Texas A&M. It's actually, so they actually I remember. Think it's holy ground. Yeah, it's like a, it's a memorial hall for those fallen Aggies through the wars, as well as when the bonfire fell, those students. Okay. And so, like, the student center, like, you just take your hat off. You can't walk on the grass 
people will start yelling at you really? if you step on the grass in that area. Wow. And, you know, it's it's just a little different culture-wise. It's so, a little different. Well, I'm glad anyways. you got to experience the Mighty Buffaloes before you go down my to son, Texas. My son has been listening to the CU fight song every morning on the way to school. Yes. There are two versions of that song. Yes. There's the, the PG version. Oh, and, okay. I yeah. didn't know that. And then there are... It, people have added words. Yeah. I think the... Um, <laughs> The language arts department of Colorado <laughs> <laughs> you, added words. The best part about CU is like it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful oh my venue. Gosh. It's an unbelievable. Who doesn't want day. to go to the buffs? Right, mountains, so, sun. And I, I, we sat in a section that had longtime bus fans who were very nice, kind, cordial individuals. So we had a great experience. So you were not sitting next to the student section. No, but the restroom line was so yeah. long. We walked to the student section yeah. one because that was like the shortest bathroom yeah and that was interesting for my <laughs> 10 year old eight year old to hear the language come yeah out you learn new words yeah totally <laughs> so you know it's just it's a culture thing yeah so i have sat in the student section at texas a&m when we went last time we had a, a cousin who had was still a student she got a student sweet tickets. and that was really fun because there's only one time you sit down the whole game at texas a&m oh really that's when the visiting band plays. Oh, I thought it was when you guys were praying for a victory. No. <laughs> but so you have to stand the whole time. You stand through the Aggie band because it's a military band. So it's a very formal. Like the whole tradition. stadium stands. Or this is. The student, student section okay. does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's super, super fun. There's a lot of fun traditions. Rumor on the street is people want Coach Prime to leave Colorado go be an Aggie. You know, the problem with that is he can't take his son or Travis Hunter. Okay. So, so you're saying we're, we're okay. I mean, here's the thing with the CU fans. Yeah, tell we're, us. We're about to get to Revelation. Don't worry, people. Mm -hmm. But give us a revelation yeah. on the CU buffs first. Every great job that comes available until the day he leaves, everyone's going to throw his name into it. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. So yeah. just buckle up, buttercups. It's all right. It's kind of like when a senior pastor position opens, that you get an email. Right, and right. It's like, I listen, <laughs> you don't poach him from Calvary Bible Church. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Revelation. Yep. And we're we're in the thick of it, my friends. These are the, yeah. These are the. These are the chapters everyone skips. Deep, deep texts of the scriptures. Yeah. And part of the reason why is, we talked about this even in my life group, is like the language is still so strange. And it, you feel like if you hang out with the language, you would get to know it better. And then you end up, you're like, nope, still strange. Every week from week to week. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think we'll go into this weekend um, on Sunday. And even there, the angel gives the interpretation of what John has saw, has right. seen. And it's still confusing. <laughs> yeah. Totally. He's like, let me tell you about the woman and the rider of the, of the beast. And then we're still like wondering, wait, I'm confused. Right. Totally. But I do think if you can get your mindset in biblical language and how the Bible talks about things, mm -hmm. and just know that there is a spoken language that you're not privy to, and educate yourself as much as possible, it becomes at least less foreign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the big takeaway for me this week, and I wonder if this is true, these two chapters really were focused on what God is doing mm -hmm. in the sense of God is the one who is the rightful one to bring judgment yeah, I think this is where Revelation is. We said this, you know, at least a dozen times. Revelation is a book about worship. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see the worship in the throne room. You're going to see the lack of worship on earth. You're going to see the false worship of the beast. And you're just going to see, oh, man, God is exalted to such a high view. We're seeing Jesus in a way that maybe we haven't seen him before. Right? There's like a transfiguration of Jesus, the, the ascension of Jesus, the glorified Jesus. Um, and it should lead us to worship. We should go, man, if God is that big and that great, I, I want to worship him. Mm -hmm. Which which is not, hey, I want to sing some songs simply. This is, I want to give my allegiance and my life to follow the sovereign Lord. The one who, in this case, judges mm -hmm. the earth with righteousness and equity. Yeah, but when he judges the earth, he is the only one who actually knows how to do it the proper way. That's true, because all of our judgments are... I, I use this word perverted just because it's it's bent, it's warped, mm -hmm. it's a favoritism, it's me centered, you know, however you want to say it. Mm -hmm. But all judgments of man are perverted. Mm -hmm. I loved um, 
Pastor Perry had had preached the same text in Bowler. Mm-hmm. I did a great job. If you were confused in Erie, <laughs> you should download <laughs> Perry Marshall in Boulder. Uh, but he opened up talking about referees mm-hmm. and the the game that was ref the women's championship last year, mm-hmm. and how there were some controversial calls and. They actually went and reviewed the game and said, "You know what? That didn't live up to our standard. Like, here's our standard of a 91 percent like accurately called game. This was below that standard." And you you watch every sporting event and you think, "Okay, the refs must be homegrown here, mm-hmm. right? Like somebody's mom is calling the game, um, or their dad's on the field." And we have, you know, just a bent way of looking at even just the the sporting events that we watch, mm-hmm. let alone the life we're trying to interpret. Right, and so it's wonderful to know that there's a God who sees all the evidence. Like He's not, He does not, He's not going to execute His judgment in favoritism or any partiality. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not bent towards the rich or to the poor. Um, it's not for some some class mm-hmm. of people or some race of people. It is His perfect, right, equitable justice. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, we all crave justice, right? But we don't love the one who is usually making the decisions mm-hmm. on our behalf. And here's God who makes those decisions. Yeah. And the Bible teaches us how to wait by asking how long, O oh Lord. Yeah, what and, do you think about that? You, you said you had mentioned that about the Psalms. Yeah, I think the Psalms, and this is, goes back to, we've talked about this a bunch on the weekly over the years. The Psalms give us a language on how to do life, how to pray through life, how to worship through life, and how to do life at its best. This gives us language. Mm-hmm. And so when you're a person who has read the Psalms over and over again, which I think you should read the Psalms every day. And when you get to 150, start back over, right? And that should be your prayer book for the rest of of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so the psalmist tells us and teaches us how to ask when we see injustice. We need to cry out, how long, O Lord? And you pointed it out, actually, in Revelation 6, it comes here, and it's back again, right? As we're starting to wrap up the judgments, it's like he's answering this question. Yeah. Now is the time. Back, yeah, back in six, they were, they were crying out, how long, how long, until you vindicate us. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a misunderstood word in the sense of like, man, he's going to just go and, and do harm to people mm-hmm. who harmed his people. And vindicate really is to show that our witness and our testimony was true. So how long until you almost reveal yourself in a world so that everyone knows that Jesus is king? Mm -hmm. How long until you show that the world we are talking about of heaven and earth is real? How long until you judge evil and wickedness? And here we're seeing in the seventh bowl, that's now. We're going to judge the whole earth. And we we talked about that on Sunday. You think that was helpful of just reminding the frame of Revelation around the three cycles? Oh, definitely. There's definitely three cycles in here that we need to point out. And you, you mentioned that the first cycle was... One was the seals. Yeah, it was was actually a quarter of the earth. A quarter of the earth. So the judgments that come from the seals affects a quarter of the earth. And then the judgments that affect are one third of the earth? With the trumpet judgments. Okay. Yep. And then now we're reading the full judgment of the bulls. Yeah, the bulls is going to cover the whole earth. What do you, as you look through the, this text, the angels play such a big, I think that's another thing that I think we should point out in Revelation is that, the angels have a real job yeah. in heaven, and we're watching their jobs here unfold. Yeah, and there's seven different angels with seven different bowls. As you study the text, what do you notice about angels that you, maybe has caught your attention or helped you reframe what you think about them? Well, I think you know th- there's no lack of work of angels through the Old Testament, through the Gospels. You see them ministering to Jesus, right? They're carrying messages to Daniel. Mm-hmm. So angels are all over the place. One of the, the most important t- uh, individuals in the birth narratives as yeah. we think about Christmas. Exactly. And so you, you see that they actually have a real job that's going to continue until the Lord brings completion to the earth. Mm-hmm. Um, they're his messengers. They're the ones that carry out tasks. It's, it's pretty wild to think about, actually. Yeah, it is really wild. Which, you know, for some of us, like, oh, man, I was touched by an angel. And you're like, oh, tell me about that experience. And like, I was just warm and fuzzies. And I want to be like, I don't think you saw an angel, man. Yeah. Like when people see angels, they do one of two things. They they want to die because mm-hmm. they're terrified. Or two, they want to worship it. You're right. And we see that in Revelation. Um, they want to worship this angel. The angel says, no, don't worship me. Right. Worship Jesus. Worship God alone, period. Um, 
which again, there's an, a fun apologetic of the deity of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. is Jesus does not tell people not to worship him. Mm-hmm. All angels do. And so he's not just a prophet. He's not just an angelic being. He's the son of God. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that one's free. Well, and it tells you how to maybe spot them out in the Old Testament when yeah. the angel doesn't say, don't worship me. It could, that could be a good a clue. figure man of Jesus. Yeah. So I don't remember the question, but angels are cool. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how has it deepened your understanding of them? Like, you know, just in your personal yeah. reflection of bumping into them every week. I think you're summing it up, but is there something new that you never know I think it before? just goes and heightens the awareness of not everything that's happening today that I see mm-hmm. is just flesh and bones. Mm. It, it's it's not important. just creation mm. busted and broken. It's not, not just my own flesh that's broken. Like there is a spiritual battle going on. That I mean, obviously, the New Testament is, you know, highlighting constantly. I mean, this mm-hmm. is actually our our battle. It's not against flesh and blood, right? But there's actually something going on that has cosmic implications between yeah. angels and fallen angels, between God's agenda and Satan's agenda. Mm-hmm. That if we're not privy to, it just feels like, man, that was a hard week. Yeah, there's a lot of evil in this world. What's wrong? Mm-hmm. And this helps us understand a little bit more of it. So good. Okay, in chapter 15 and 16, there's these big worship texts that we slow down. And I love how the ESV, especially in the journals that we have, has highlighted them by by editing, like by formatting them. Yeah, they format them as in music text. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you notice about these texts? Are they are they Old Testament texts? Are they Psalms? Are they Mary's Magnificat? What are, what's going on here with these yeah. texts? They're, they're victory songs. So in the mm. Old Testament, you have Moses. He sang a song. Deborah, song of Deborah. She sang a song. Um, these are victory texts to talk about how great God is and the work that God has done. So the first one in 15 is, is Moses' text. It's not, li- it's not word for word. Yeah. And so you're incorporating Moses' language. Mm. And then it also says the song of the Lamb, right? Right. So the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Revelation had said they're, they're going to sing a new song that only the children of God know. Mm. And so I think this is this is giving us an insight into a new song that only the children of God know how to sing. I, it's amazing that we've never we've never studied these texts. If this, this is our song, yeah. Why why wouldn't I know these? You well, know I, mean? I think in a sense, I mean I'm not I'm not a great um hymnologist. Yeah. That's even a, a proper term. Yeah. Uh hymnist. Hymnist. <laughs> hymnologist, hymnist. I don't know. Someone like Mark Wicks would know. If only he was here. Only the Canadian was in the room. But you, you go back and you think, how many great hymns that you know mm-hmm. are actually influenced and written from Revelation? Right. Crown him with many crowns. I mean, a, we have a rich, we have rich verbiage from Revelation. So we might not even recognize that a lot of our music comes from Revelation. It makes sense because those are songs to drive us to worship. And it's a book of worship. It's a wor- worship, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the, the, what's interesting about the first psalm or for the first song, sorry, the first song, is that they sing it before the execution of the plagues and judgments. Mm-hmm. So Moses sang it after that. Mm. And it's like it's it's almost like the writers making you aware that God's judgments and his rescue and the ultimate exodus is so sure that people are singing about it, singing about his victory mm. before it happens. That's wonderful. And so for the believer it's like, yeah, let's we'll sing the song. We know how the thing ends. Right. Which gives, it should just it should just settle our soul, mm. right? There's so much anxiety in the world. These sorts of texts should settle us down and say, man, we know the God who's in charge. We know how he's acting. Let's take a deep breath. Though it looks like chaos out there, we know, man, God, you are so good. You have given us the victory. So That's really good, Thomas. So when we look at these bowls, these are like new plagues? Are these old plagues? What are do you these? think? Well, I mean, like yeah. you're reading them. Yeah, I I think it's interesting that like they sort of remind me of the Exodus plagues, and I was like, are, "What's happening? Is it a retelling of Exodus? Is it a further telling? Is Exodus actually warning us of what God will do someday?" Yeah, you know, like from book into book in, we know that there's going to be judgments, and it's interesting that the the correlation here for me is that there's some people even in these seven bulls that don't repent. Right. And in Pharaoh's day, he doesn't repent. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that makes sense. You know, and just a reminder that when God judges, people just get more mad at him. They actually don't submit to him. Yeah. 
which tells you the stubbornness of Pharaoh. We knew the Pharaoh's stubbornness. We 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 read it in Exodus, but in Revelation, we it's still happening. Yeah, I I, I totally agree with you. I don't think they're you know plague for plague, mm-hmm. you know a total recapitulation of what happened in 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 Egypt, but they are the parallels. Mm-hmm. And so the reader, the writer, sorry, definitely wants you as a reader to link your mind to oh. I feel like I've heard this story before in a very specific geographical location in which now is being played out globally, which is God's judgment of evil in the world. Mm -hmm. And these are plagues. I think, you know, you think of Egypt. When I think of the Exodus story, there's some fascinating stuff. One being each plague that God uses in Egypt directly was an assault against an Egyptian deity. Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely, and, and so he's that's showing, fascinating. Yeah, he's showing you like, okay, you worship Ra. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna darken the sun. Mm-hmm. You worship. If I get these all right, I don't know if I would. You know, Isis, or Isol, um, the god of the Nile, and so I'm gonna plague the Nile. Mm-hmm. Right? You th- you think you're gonna worship the god of fertility? I'm going to destroy you know livestock to show you that God is you know superior, right? Um, and, and a good, I mean, you can Google like the parallels between. Egyptian gods totally. and the plagues. I just butchered it, but yeah. And that they're mostly accurate. Yeah. When you Google and, that. And the last one culminating in, okay, you think Pharaoh's God. Mm-hmm. Okay, the last plague is death and affects Pharaoh's house. And it takes his first Just born. so, hey, pay attention. You're yeah. not God. Right. These aren't gods. I'm God. And so part of the plagues wasn't just simply judgment, but if you go back and read the Exodus story over and over and over again, God says, Moses, you would execute these plagues that Egypt will know that I am the Lord God. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's informing them, of like, who is this Lord? Because remember, Moses comes to Pharaoh in the very beginning. He says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know your God. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like Moses saying, well, let me introduce you. Yeah. Like, you have failed to know the creator of the universe, and now I will introduce you to the God of Israel, the mm-hmm. true God. And so, again, it's like the world says, I don't know God. And God says, okay, I will introduce myself to you. Yeah. And then in fourth bowl and fifth bowl, they said... They do not repent of their deeds. They don't repent. So you broke them up into the first six, at least. I didn't, but some scholars have. Yeah, I, I did read a book. One, yeah. yeah, one through four are ecological, so they have to do with natural world stuff. Right? Yeah, well, in the first, even in the in the seals mm-hmm. and in the trumpets and in the bowls, the first four are kind of categorically together mm-hmm. and have a lot of environmental, ecological implications. And then the, the following three look like it's more of a direct assault against evil itself, the source of evil. And the adversaries. Yeah. So, and the beast comes up again. We talked about the beast last week. Um, the beast is defeated yeah. at the bull. Yeah, his throne room yeah, is directly assaulted by the plagues, which wow. is great. That's and cool. so, I don't know, we, we talked about the wrath of God, mm-hmm. and we just said, you know, all of us have wrath. It's It can be bent. Um, it can it can show favoritism, which means we're not the good judge. Mm-hmm. But God has wrath, which is the right and fitting response to evil. Mm-hmm. And so when God says, it is finished, like when he pours out these bowls, he says, this is the end of my wrath. That also means, this is why it's so good, that also means it's the end of evil. Mm-hmm. For God's wrath is associated with the presence of evil. So if he has poured out the fullness of his wrath and there's nothing left to be angry about, that also simultaneously means that's the end of Wickedness, of evil, of sin, of perversions, of the things that harm our life. That's done. And so the other piece of it is, we didn't talk about it on Sunday, so much of this language is decreation. Mm-hmm. And so you're, you're taking the seas that were brought together, and then you're judging the seas. You, you're taking the lands and the stars and the skies, and, and then you're like bringing it back down to you know, the, the darkness, essentially, which is God decreating the world as it currently is. It's like almost like re- like deconstructing a house that has mold and and um, finding the good bones. And so he's deconstructing the world, making room ready, what he's about to do with the rest of Revelation, which is reconstruct or bring about his new creation. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's cool to think about, okay, this is his work. This is how he answers, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm-hmm. How, does, how does thy will that's being done in heaven become earth's reality? Wow. And it's fascinating for a believer to read it and participate in the the joy of this and also the sadness and yeah. sorrow. It's a big mixed bag of emotions. Yeah, it goes back to 
you know, when John's told to eat the scroll mm-hmm. and it's bittersweet, it's like sweet because yeah, you want justice. Mm-hmm. And then it's bitter in the stomach. It's like, I can't stomach this. Yeah. This is, this is really hard to watch. Right. But, okay. okay, Let's talk about this crazy word. Armageddon. Yeah. What do you think about Armageddon? What comes to mind? Okay. What comes to mind when you hear the word Armageddon? Um, because I have the music from the nineties on the movie Armageddon. (laughs) How's it say? Bruce Willis. That's the only thing I think of is Bruce Willis. With, uh, was it Ben Affleck? I don't remember. Like flying a spaceship with a nuclear bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I just remember man. the soundtrack to that movie. I don't even so remember the good. movie. The soundtrack was epic. Who was, who, who sings that song? Aerosmith. That's Aerosmith. Oh yeah, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, yeah Aerosmith. Yeah. Sorry, I only know the Gettys. Right. Um, <laughs> Ray Bolts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's all, that's all comes to my mind. It's yeah. like end of the world. Like even in the media, yeah. this is an Armageddon moment. This it's is Armageddon. People in like we you know, use it all the CNN, time. CNN, Fox, I mean totally. MSNBC, New York Times, Gaza, Hamas was Armageddon. Yeah, yeah. So so Armageddon essentially like has a cultural flavor for us today too. Oh, totally. We sort of know what it is. End of the world. End of the world. Yeah. Like not into the world. <laughs> Lots of bombs going off <laughs> into the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like that. Do aliens come at Armageddon? <laughs> I don't remember. I don't know. I, saw, I, saw I just that. remember Aerosmith, okay? I just remember Aerosmith. I don't remember if there were aliens or not. But you talk about there's actually the Valley of Megiddo. Yeah, Megiddo. And that was super interesting. Well, it, it, I guess my biblical Hebrew is, is very limited. Yeah, but I totally get it. Armageddon, or Armageddon is just Har, mm-hmm. meaning Mount or mountain, Megiddo. So mountain of Megiddo. Mm-hmm. And the, the peculiar thing, as people look at that, is there's a famous place of Megiddo, mm-hmm. uh, north of Israel, I believe, up by Galilee. Um, if that's correct. If it's not correct, somebody can write in the show notes. Yeah. But famous battles happened there. Okay, it's like what famous battles? Well, you got to go to the kings. Okay. So. Uh, oh, I was just in it. I was in, just in Second Kings. Okay. So, so some of some of those either. battles are going to be in there. Really? So famous battles in which Israel kind of marks out in their mind, like we would Gettysburg, mm-hmm. Pearl Harbor, um, D Day. Yeah. And so the question that, that that people are asking is, okay, when you actually go to Megiddo, it's flat, mm-hmm. and there's no mountain there. And if all the armies of the of the world are supposed to gather here, there's not enough room for them. And uh, Perhaps this is talking about more of a global sense in which the armies are coming against the people of God. And this is just to recount kind of like Gettysburg. This will be the turning point of the war or D-Day. This is going to be the, really the end of the, the war, the climactic battle to end the conflict. So that's, that's basically what we're talking about on Sunday. That's amazing. Jezreel Valley. Jezreel Valley. Yeah. Is that it? Okay. It's in the Jezreel Valley, which is super interesting. Is that like, when you read this text once again, you know that it's grounded in something that is familiar. Yeah, I think one of the things we even try to do with the graphics of the, the book of Revelation is in the graphics of Revelation, maybe people know this, maybe they don't, that's actually a picture of Patmos, which is where John was when he sees these visions and writes these accounts. And just, I think a lot of people think of Revelation as otherworldly. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where a lot of the stumbling block comes from when they have to realize Revelation is very earthy. Mm. And so even in their terminology of battles, it's rooted in historical geographical te- like areas. Right. Even like Jerusalem, Israel, it's in geographical areas, meaning it's earthy. And like what God's going to do is make all things new. It has earthy implications. Wow. And then the, the plagues, right? Right. They're environmental. They're ecological they're they're a God, way god's way of saying hey pay attention yeah okay you're not god you're not in charge of pestilence like i do think about you know people ask about like covid19 or whatever and i think man it's just like end time stuff and i think in in the sense you can just say hey anytime you see a global pandemic it's to get your eyes on jesus on god saying hey this world is not the way it is and to be reminded that we need god's intervention whereas mo- most of our leaders during even like COVID-19, we're like, we will crush this. Right. We will be victorious. Right. We will overcome this. We'll use technology. We'll use medicine. You stay home. We'll get you safe. Yeah. And it's like, I, I think that's the arrogance of like Nebuchadnezzar mm-hmm. that God's directly going against, which is, you know, you need God. 
Yeah. And this is another reminder that you need the Lord. Okay, I have a really, really hard question. Yeah. And we have these three judgments. Okay. The quarter, the one-third, the full. Are these happening now or will these happen? Yeah. I'll give you three ideas of interpretation. Okay. And there are more than this. So one would say, absolutely. So this is a characterization of the times of Jesus. These are the last days from his ascension mm -hmm. to his second coming. And so this is the character of the world that you live in. This is its, its nature, which I think is true, right? Wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, disease, earthquakes, famines. That has described the world that we live in. So in one sense, it would be unusual if those were the descriptions of our world. And then we would say, I've never heard of an earthquake. Do you know what an earthquake is? No. It must be something at the end of the age. Mm. So that would be unusual um, if none of these events were happening and we were saying, hey, it's just descriptions of our world. However, it is descriptions of our world. And so therefore, you could lean towards, hey, this is descriptions of the world as it is, period. Mm. The other camp on the other side would say, no, these, these are earthquakes as the world has never seen before. And so all of this is reserved for the final days. Mm. Or where I would lean this is me always trying to like have cake and eat it, is yes and no. Like Jesus described the last days as birth pangs. And he said, when you see these things happening, it's not the end, but it is the beginning of the end. And birth pangs are, you know, contractions mm -hmm. happen for over a period of time, culminating in the delivery of your child, right? Mm -hmm. And the first contraction categorically is the same as the last contraction. Mm -hmm. Now, I've never been pregnant, but my wife tells me the last contraction is rather different mm -hmm. than the first one. It's like, ooh, I think I had a contraction. The last one is like, you're at nine centimeters, 10 centimeters, baby's coming. So like characteristically, yeah, they're the same, but they've grown mm -hmm. in two things. One, intensity and frequency. And so when you see these things growing in intensity and frequency, I think you're seeing the, the conclusion of them. Now, is this the intensity and frequency that is the end? I don't know that. But I would say, yeah, you're actually seeing more and more of this being poured out. So what you're saying is what you said on Sunday, which the text says in 16, it says, actually, it's in 15, sorry. No, maybe it's in 16. Where is it? Where it says, be ready. Be ready. That's uh, 1615. Yeah, 16. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go ahead, go about naked and be seen exposed. Yeah. Be, be awake. Like, be anticipatory of Christ's return. Mm. I think when we ask that question on Sunday, who thinks that Jesus could come tomorrow? The majority of people in the room did not raise their hand. Now, that could mean because they don't want to participate in fun games. Mm -hmm. But I just thought, okay, no, actually, this is the call to everybody in this room to wake up, right. to be in the reality that Jesus Christ can come at any time. And maybe he comes later today, maybe he doesn't. But we live as though it is possible. So, let's stay awake, Calvary. Stay awake. Prayerful, right? Not just cups of coffee from Calvary. Prayerful and caffeinated. <laughs> let's stay awake. Yeah. Let's be having our garments on ready for the return of Christ. Yeah. I hope, Calvary, you're blessed by this conversation. Let us know in the show notes on YouTube, what you're thinking, what questions you have, as well as let's continue to remind each other and gather weekly here at Calvary to stay awake, worship the living God, and be ready for this wonderful, wonderful, great day. All right, thanks. Thanks.